Agbo, you want to slide us into queering all of these things? <laughs> of course, of course. And I can also share my screen. Let me see. Make sure I'm doing this right. Oh no. Ugh. This is like the first time I've ever shared my screen, so please be patient with me. <laughs> You're doing great, Agbo. <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna talk about a bit about um, how, um, what Spark is and how we sort of like queer um, RJ and I guess how it sort of relates to what we're discussing here today. So just a bit about Spark. So just a bit about Spark. Um, we work to build and strengthen the power of our communities and an RJ movement that centers black women, women of color and queer and trans young people of color in Georgia and the South. Um, we have fostered a dynamic collaborative model of advocacy, leadership development, collective action and discourse that creates power for black women and queer individuals struggles for reproductive justice. So Spark really centers um, queer and trans young people of color and organizing and advocacy when we talk about reproductive justice. Um, and that sort of came out of a need um, to have these conversations about how we uplift and center queer and trans um, and non-binary um, young folks when we talk about RJ. Um, because um, historically, just throughout the reproductive justice movement, these voices haven't been centered and uplifted. And it's when we talk about just any justice movement, we want to talk about centering those most impacted um, by these horrible, horrible systems that we have to combat every day. So, you know, we talk about capitalism, um, racism, sexism, all of like these horrible isms and systems of oppression that we are combating when we talk about um, reproductive justice. And I'm making sure I'm paying attention to the chat in case folks have questions. Um, oh. So, um, what Spark really in intends to do with um, this framework is build new leadership, change color, or <laughs> change color, <laughs> change culture, and advance knowledge in Georgia and then South to ensure individuals and communities have the power and resources to make sustainable and liberatory decisions about our bodies, gender, um, sexualities, and lives. Um, so, as um, Alison already uplifted, um, reproductive justice is about you know, autonomy and agency. Um, and when we talk about autonomy and agency, we're talking about, you know, do we have what we need to be able to make like these decisions about how we live our lives? Um, and, you know, as Allison pointed out, if you know, we're living in communities that aren't healthy for us, if, you know, um, we can't breathe the air, we can't have healthy pregnancies because we can't drink the water and we can't just live our lives safely. Um, you know, that's not reproductive justice, it's not RJ, it's not conducive to us living our best lives. Um, so how, you know, what Spark intends to do is to challenge these systems um, and uplift the voices of folks who are most impacted by these horrible systems um, because they know, um, what is happening in their communities um, and they we, they need to be the drivers of those change. So thank you, Gayla, for like, you know, how you sort of explained how um, even in Georgia conservation um, um, folks that, you know, y'all build leadership and y'all acknowledge that, you know, folks living in this community, in these communities should be at the forefront of the organizing and the work they need to do to make their um, communities livable and healthy. So Spark also works to ensure the liberation of all people, but our analysis is specifically anchored in the lasting legacy of the enslavement and exploitation of Black people in the South through economic disenfranchisement, racial inequality, and reproductive oppression. And you know, these are things that still occur today, right? Um, so we honor and uplift the importance of the work that's already been done here in the South, um, all of like just the work that's been do, that's been done to combat, you know, from slavery to, um, you know, Jim Crow, racial segregation, um, and then just like the work to fight reproductive oppression um, before Spark was even an, um, an organization specifically in the South, right? So 
we um, honor those folks and we recognize um, their impact and their importance and we know that we need to um, continue doing that work. So queering reproductive justice. So what does it mean to queer reproductive justice? Um, as Allison already uplifted, you know, we know that RJ um, is a movement um, dedicated to um, giving folks the um, ability to have children, not have children, parent the children they have in um, safe, sustainable communities, um, and bodily autonomy, right? Um, so what do it, does it mean when we say we're queering that concept? So Spark uplifts that um, queer and trans liberation, like the queer and trans liberation movement and RJ are interwoven, they can't be separated. So when we're talking about reproductive justice, it's very, very important that we do center queer and trans folks because otherwise um, what we you know, say is that you know, you're not really doing reproductive justice. You're not centering those most impacted by these horrible reproductive oppressions and policies. Um, and it's very important that you center those voices so that we all may benefit from the outcome. So it's willful and intentional about full inclusion of our communities, um, people of color, queer, trans, cis, gender non-conforming, gender non-binary, all gender identities. Um, so yeah, we're very, very intentional about centering those voices and then creating space for um, intentional inclusivity. Um, so sort of how we um, do that just through Sparks programming, um, our RJ Leadership Campfire um, for um, queer and trans people of color and then cis black women as well. It's like, it won't let me, okay, there it goes, all right. Um, so it's necessary to work on the immediate issues that dangerously impact our communities while simultaneously doing the work, oops, sorry, of systemic cultural change. Um, so we recognize that, you know, as like um, Allison and Gayla, y'all are uplifting, there are like actual environmental concerns going on in our communities in Atlanta, you know, not having safe drinking water, um, lead in our dirt, and the air not being safe to breathe. I like live in that area where, you know, they um, have like all of these um, pollutants from like the sterilization plant or whatever um, in the air, right? And how, you know, how is that impacting, you know, um, my body, how like, you know, thinking in the future, like how, you know, if I do like decide to have these considerations about like having children or whatever, you know, I, that's something that I have to consider like the environment I live in. Um, and that's real, that's today, that's now. Um, so we definitely acknowledge like those re very real um, issues that are occurring right now um, and then work to do that systemic change, right? So, um, talking to our communities, educating folks about, you know, these issues going on, like attending this, you know, webinar, this panel, um, you know, so yeah. And then some of like, some of like the tangible piece that we do when we talk about querying reproductive justice, um, just in how we show up in space and how we organize, um, we understand how cis-centered language can isolate um, queer and trans people from the conversation and the movement. Um, so some of the terms that we uplift, you know, people who have penises, just depending on the situation, right? Um, so people have penises, people have a vagina, uh, people with a uterus or can physically carry a child, ability to get pregnant, people with the ability to create sperm, um, people with one or the other, and people with both. So just very, just simple shifts in language um, can really, really help when we're um, organizing in community and centering queer and trans folks. Um, and it can all be very like situational, like, you know, if you're talking about, you know, folks and community, or if you're talking just about like a specific situation, you adjust your language accordingly um, without necessarily having like that gendered language, right? Um, and being very, very mindful and intentional about it in outreach, advocacy, organizing, and messaging. RJ and queer liberation are inseparable. That's a thing. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's real. Like, you know, as I said before, um, these are things that, um, you know, can't be separated from each other. If you're really doing reproductive justice, um, you're really doing the work to make sure folks can have children, not have children, and um, 
parent the children they have in a safe, sustainable environment and to bodily autonomy, you have to have those considerations of queer, trans, um, and non-binary folks, um, making sure that their voices are centered. And then some like, um, when we're uplifting trans folks specifically, some oppressions that we um, keep in mind, um, being cis, that concept of cis assumed and passing and like sort of the privilege that comes with that and that just being a concept at all. Um, why is it necessarily like the assumption that the goal is to quote unquote be cis assumed or, you know, pass, right? So challenging that, that's another way we sort of like queer sort of our conceptions of these issues, right? Um, pronouns as I've already sort of um, alluded to um, at the beginning of this call and in the chat um, we were able to sort of um, introduce ourselves with our names and our pronouns um, very very just simple action of um, making the space a bit safer for queer trans and gender non-binary folks um, how trans folks are able to navigate medical spaces um, right, um, the concept of transitioning, gender markers, right, it's very, very hard and costly in the state of Georgia to have your gender marker changed. Um, so we do the work to sort of challenge that and like change that so that folks are able to simply have their gender markers 